to the 26th episode of Flowers and Friends. Can you believe it, Kira? <laughs> 26 <laughs> episodes have happened so far, Anna. I what know. a fun time that we have had with this. <laughs> we've had, we've met so many great people. We've learned so much and mostly we've had a great time talking about flowers with our friends. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Galena. I'm one of the co-hosts of this incredible talk show, Flowers and Friends. Kara here is with us, and we're missing Dion. But no. yeah, <laughs> we're missing Dion today. So Dion is hosting her own retreat, and we just wish her so much luck. I know she's having so much fun there. I saw well, her pictures. It's incredible, I, isn't it? I right. wish I was there. <laughs> I, I know, right? And she had Lori Siebert there, which Lori was one of our guests too that we've had on this show. It's been so fun to see them meet in real life, you know? <laughs> Hello, yeah. I'm Kara Jameson. I'm one of the co-hosts for the Flowers and Friends talk show for Bloom TV Network. We have a really fun show in store for mm -hmm. you today. We are going to talk to Tom and Sarah of the Grateful Gardeners all about flower farming and aquaponics. I am I'm very so excited. excited. I have so many questions. So let's get into the show today. Yay. is this to learn about dahlias i know, I know. this is going to come really handy to you but i think to everyone because everybody wants to grow dahlias yeah I've well, told you. And, and you know what's really fun about these flowers and friends talk show you know a lot of people are watching the reruns uh the replays yes. on this and so this will be a really fun show um to air even next next spring you know when we start planting dahlias again mm -hmm. And uh, people can know like how they can increase how many flowers they could potentially grow. Look, look at our comments, Anna. Oh man, I want to say hello. From Let's Spain, see. San Diego, Tijuana. I yeah, see Carmen. hey Carmen, Linda, Patti, hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Let us know where you're watching us from, please, because you know we love that. And yes. well, why don't we talk about last week's episode? Okay. It was huge. <laughs> Yeah, um, a lot of people really liked uh, watching us make pumpkins. Uh, tell me about your pumpkin. How's your pumpkin doing? <laughs> no, I gave it to my sister oh, after the show. She immediately was like, do you think you have some leftover flowers? And I'm like, do you want my pumpkin with flowers? And she's I like, know, yes, right? Yes. Right. So I have my pumpkin right here it, because it's a, you know, dried flowers on there. And this pumpkin will last forever. You know, it's like the pumpkin that keeps on giving here. Um, so I uh, work with a garden apron company uh -huh. and they were having a contest of um, who could do a no carve pumpkin. And um, they were going to donate uh, $200 to a food bank um, to, in the person's name that won. And so I was like, I just made this for the flowers <laughs> talk show. So I submitted it. And um, thanks to all my flower friends, I won. So, yes. uh, so you won. You said it so slowly. She won. <laughs> First yeah. prize. Yeah. So we get to help a food bank out. And then. Um, my church contacted me and they're having a dinner this weekend and someone from there was like, do you have any fall decorations? And I was like, yeah, I just flowers and friends talk to them. Came in handy. There we go. <laughs> All right. So Anna, let's show everyone a quick clip yes. uh, of last week's show. One of the things I like the most about fall with fresh flowers is all the different textures you get. For uh -huh. me, a fall flower needs to have as many textures as you mm -hmm. can. So I also have from other flowers I purchased some millet. I love this. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. That's a fun one to grow. 
So what I'm going to do is I already have my foliage. I'm going to add a little bit more of this Ruscus to give height and set limits for my flowers. And then this time I'm going to arrange my flowers in groups. And I'm going to have like a group of sunflowers, a group of marigolds, just to make it different and not like the typical mixed flower arrangement. I think when you slow down enough to do things like this, you're really allowing yourself to feel and work through the season and it not go by so quickly. Exactly. You know what I mean? I, I, totally. Kara, yeah, and, you know, Kara, when you're out digging in the dirt mm -hmm. and you're planting, it really seems like it slows down the season because you're working in it rather than through the season. You're literally immersing yourself in the time of year and in a much simple, smaller way. I feel like that's what home styling and home decor will do for you. I'm going to try to dry these this year and see what it looks like. And boy, it's like the perfect purple pop. And then here's the top of my pumpkin. I dried um, some dahlias that I grew this year. This was a pretty purple one that dried this beautiful, like deep cranberry. Oh, wow. Um, we've got some orange dahlias. This is dahlias. These are dahlias, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yay oh hello i think we lost anna there for just a second um so last week's show was just so fun making those pumpkins today we have bloom tv experts tom and sarah of the grateful gardeners that are gonna join us let's bring them on screen and say hello hey there. hello welcome thank you so much for thank being you. here today Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. We are so excited to talk with you and hear about your story, your flower farming journey, what you do with it, and even your aquaponics journey, which I am really, really excited to hear about. Uh, yeah. Tom and Sarah is a husband and wife team who grows an organic cut flower farm in Maryland, about 30 miles from Washington, D.C. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's Amazing. Right. And uh, this year, you guys have undertaken a really big expansion. You have gone from one acre to 34 acres. Really? That's correct. That's wow. correct. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. So welcome. We're very excited to Thank have you. you. Hey, Anna. I'm back. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> the of live Hi. streaming. <laughs> yeah. But I'm back. Hi, Tom and Sarah. So happy to be here with you. Yes, yeah. Thanks, Anna. thanks so much for having us. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Tom and Sarah, tell us like your backstory. How did you get into flower farming and where you're at today? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I feel like we tell this story all the time. Like we do, but yeah, okay. it's important. Yeah. It's important to always, important. always, yeah. always remember your roots. That's, that's what yes. it's important. Um, so my, my mom, uh, Diana, she has grown dahlias for 30 years or so. Um, mm -hmm. we used to live in Canby, Oregon which when I was a kid, like I was like nine, 10 years old. And that's the home of Swan Island Dahlias, and which is a, a really famous grower mm -hmm. and, and provider of, of Dahlia tubers. Mm -hmm. And my mom just fell in love with them there, which, you know, it's easy to do. Um, and she's been growing them ever since. And, and I, of course, as a kid, teenager, young man, I had no interest in any of that stuff. <laughs> huh? Little did had, you know. <laughs> I know, right? It's kind of strange how these things happen. Um, but so, my, and one of the goals that my mom had, so she's, you know, almost 70 years old now and she's ready, she's been re retired and, and moved on from, from her career. One of the things she wanted to do was to create her own flower farm as a, as a retirement thing. Like, you know, mm -hmm. she had, didn't have to worry necessarily about making a huge amount of money from it, but that's what she wanted to do is to grow mm -hmm. flowers professionally. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so she has now done that. She has her own farm in Colorado called Rocky mountain blooms. Give her a follow if you, if you can. <laughs> nice. she's Hey. Um, so yeah, she's got, yeah, she's got her own flower farm. Um, and, and, uh, she took the florette course, um, from Aaron Benzikin, the famous florette course. Mm -hmm. And she was so excited about it and she wanted to share it with us. You know, she was like, Hey, you guys got to see some of these videos. She's, they're so amazing. The production values. And we're like, okay, sure. So we started watching and we're like, wow, that, that does seem kind of cool. You know, that, that seems like an interesting, I mean, anybody could do this, you know, for us <laughs> how hard could this be? How hard could it be? <laughs> Um, and so we, we went home like immediately and started just buying the basic stuff, you know, the heat mats, the lights, you know, the things to get mm -hmm. seeds started indoors or, and, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, 
really just the beginning stages. And, and honestly, after that, you don't really need much. You need some soil, you know, like mm -hmm. a bed, a raised bed or a field, cut right. a small field. And so we, we, we started down that path and, um, but we did so, yeah, we did so with a lot of impediments in the way. So, you know, not really impediments, but just life, life. Right. Um, yeah. We both were working full-time jobs. Um, we didn't have, we lived in a house on a postage stamp yard, which we were never going to be able to grow on. So we didn't have a space to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a teenager, a preteen and a grade school age child at home that yeah. needed our attention. So there were a lot of reasons why it could have just, I mean, a lot of reasons why initially it was for us, it was just like, this is just something that we can do as a hobby mm -hmm. in our free, in whatever free time we had. And together. And together. Something that it would be, together, it would be it. ours and, you know, wouldn't be because most of our time had been spent, you know, either working full time. And then on weekends we were running around to different, you know, kids events. Oh, kids, That's, kids. It was all we did. And, and, um, yep. <laughs> and kind of like, you know, this is not, really all that satisfying in, for if our whole life is just these two things. <laughs> um, we want something more. And mm -hmm. it was a second marriage for us. And we were, you know, very aware of, you know, some of the problems in just getting completely immersed in childcare in the first marriages mm -hmm. um, and not really making out and carving out time as a couple to mm -hmm. do something really soul fulfilling that was just ours. So it was very intentional for us to just we worked really hard to find space to grow on, even though it was it ultimately ended up being at my mother's place. We had explored several different options oh. uh, initially, which didn't work out because we were just determined that we were going to find a place. Yeah. Um, my mom's was sort of just like a fallback option, which was free. Right. Um, <laughs> but it still meant that for the first two years of us growing, we didn't live there, but we had to go every day. So we'd work full time get in our car, go in the evenings to attend wow. to the gardens, which were tiny That's little hard. spaces. Oh, oh wow. And, and then go home and then tend to the kids and do all the things. So it was, it was, it couldn't have lasted and been right. sustainable to continue to do that. We knew we had to live on the land that we were growing on. Um, so we ended up buying my mom's house from them because they were really looking to, to okay. scale down. Uh -huh. um, so we ended up doing that and they ended up moving into, we, they created sort of a in-law suite in the garage uh -huh. space of this small acre. And we were like, okay, an acre is not ideal, but uh -huh. we still don't know what we're doing. We, uh -huh. I, we, we, need to, we need to learn how to do this first and right. we can figure out how to lease space or maybe we'll move someday. And we just mm -hmm. didn't really, it wasn't all plotted out. Let's just put it that way. But it ended up evolving fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Wow. And this was your previous place, right? Not the current uh, farm that you're on. No, not the current life. Yeah, no, the current life is basically all flowers all the time. Um, yeah, we we. I mean, so it's you know, it's just kind of funny when you look back at all the little events. Of, uh -huh. You know, propelled you in certain directions. You know, obviously the path is never linear and never straight. Um, it's always right. like, uh, okay, well, we had this fail. So we kind of had to move in this direction or yeah. it's like you ran up against, you know, we just ran out of space. You know, we just, there's, there's only so much full sun space on that, on that existing property. And we were like, we're, we're running, we have none left. And, and mm -hmm. so that was a dilemma. And then the big thing that happened was I, so, so just, just to preface this, I think this is known amongst people who know us, but if they don't, we're very much environmentalists. We're very much about the, protecting the environment. I was born on Earth Day. I don't think I can be in there. <laughs> oh, that is so great. Yes. I know. I, 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 I Earth Day you. birthday. It's the most amazing thing ever. I love it. So uh, I don't think I could be anything other than an environmentalist. I just have to care that much about it, right? So, but we both do. And, and so one of the things from the very beginning we've been focused on is how do we grow more sustainably, more regeneratively, um, organically, whatever it is we can do. Um, and I started looking into growing techniques and ultimately stumbled upon hydroponics and then aquaponics and essentially growing, you know, in water, indoors, um, in controlled environments where you can, you know, enhance some of these sustainable sorts of, of, of approaches. Mm -hmm. um, and so once I started down that road, you know, so my background is I'm a PhD scientist. I was doing research for a long time mm -hmm. and I got I had a lot of experience writing grants uh, from that. And one of the things you can do in agriculture, obviously, is you can get grant funding to do a lot of different projects. Mm -hmm. and 
grants. Okay. And so I started writing grants. I started doing the research and saying, hey, nobody's looking at, at floriculture and aquaponics or and, and a little bit in hydroponics, but definitely not in aquaponics. And so I started doing that research and I started writing grants, you know, and, and it's a slog and I got a lot of rejection. You know, oh, of, yeah. Lots of, lots of rejections. Lots of people saying like, this will never work. This will or, never work. Why are you doing not this? Really, it's this not is... a mainstream thing. It's not interesting or just yeah, nobody, not It's not very useful. You'll hear it all. I mean, it, it, anybody who, <laughs> right. if it's new and it's not the way things are done, they're going to probably, you know, throw shade, you know? So it happens. So one day someone says, yes, I like that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Thomas is the key here. Yeah. So Tom, Tom was just like, um, I was the one in the background being like, eh, why are they talking? Why are they saying those things about, you know, she takes I offense. did, I would get so irritated. And Tom was just like, that's okay. I'm just going to, he just, it was literally like nothing was going to deter him. He would stay up yeah. like, like a college student all night. I'd get up in the morning and he would still be sitting at the computer writing grants. And, and, and then when he got a rejection, I would be infuriated and he would be irritated, <laughs> but then he'd be like, that's part of well, the process. Well, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I, now I know what to do to change it. Right. I mean, he just didn't, you know, whereas I would have been like, forget it. This is not. <laughs> I right. love yeah. It. So that's so, so, part so, of teamwork. I mean, you guys yeah. have each other to compliment and that's, that's something a lot of people don't have because a lot of people are doing it on their own. So can you tell us more about aquaponic farming? Because like me, yeah. a lot of our viewers don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, first of all, just confuse it with hydroponics. They just think it's the same, basically the same thing. And a lot of people do know what hydroponics is, which essentially is just growing plants in water mm -hmm. um, rather than in a, in a soil medium. Um, you know, so typical field farming, we all know what that is. We're growing in soil, we're irrigating, we're adding fertilizer, we're doing the very traditional agricultural methods that have been done for tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, hydroponic and aquaponic farming. Yeah. So you're growing in water mm -hmm. and in hydroponics, you're adding the nutrients yourself as a farmer. You're saying, I need to add nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. I need to add micronutrients. I need to add all of these different things to make the plant happy and grow because water and CO2 and sunlight are not enough for most plants. There are some plants that are pretty easy to grow. Like lettuce. Grow. Lettuce needs basically <laughs> nit okay. nitrogen and that's about it. Yeah. Right? And, and, you know, there's, that's why vegetable farming has really taken off with these, these methods, because a lot of the, the, the leafy greens and the tomatoes and the cucumbers and things, they just don't need a whole lot to grow. Um, and it's probably also why flowers have been late to the party when it comes to these uh -huh. techniques, um, because the flowers do require a lot more than, than okay. typical vegetable farming. So the benefits of these systems are, first of all, huge amounts of water savings, because typically water is recirculated and reused. And so you're only really losing it to evaporation, maybe a little bit in transpiration. Um, and so aquaponics specifically, 95% water savings. So you're using, you know, it's a huge amount. I mean, in the, and in drought starved areas, like places where there's not a lot of tidal water, like California, mm -hmm. these types of techniques are extremely valuable. So the water savings alone is a huge environmental factor. Okay. The other thing is we are literally not growing in soil. So you're eliminating the whole soil erosion aspect of, um, you know, essentially traditional agriculture, right? Like, right. no, we only have so much topsoil left. Mm -hmm. You know, the way it's been practiced, we have been eroding that for decades. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the main issues of, you know, climate change, all of these different things is something called land degradation, which basically just means we're just losing arable, farmable land. Mm -hmm. And so we have to start moving away from those techniques or at least revamping those techniques. But this is one way where we're not growing in soil at all. We're growing in either water itself or we're growing in a soil like medium, either clay pellets or coca core, you know, more sustainable things. Um, so basically the uh, the benefit. So that's you know, the, that's one benefit is the lack of soil. We're not having we're not doing soil erosion. Um, Eliminate weeding altogether. Right. Oh, that's nice. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like any farmer who hears that's like, what? Yeah, I like, can't tell you how many hours and backbreaking hours I spent in 95 degree heat this summer, sweating my, you know, what off, pulling right. weeds out of the dahlia beds and, and literally cursing my way through it. It was just it's awful. The bane, it's the bane yeah. of our existence. 
So I have a question. Well, first, I wanted to show, um, we have a couple photos that we can show sure. um, of your aquaponics here. Let's see. Let me put this one up right here. So while you're showing, while you're showing that picture, Kara, I just wanted to also emphasize that because I don't think Tom got to this yet, and certainly we could talk okay. about it. But he ultimately ended up getting a grant from the state of Maryland for two hundred thousand dollars. Wow! That's and, and that was that was that was you know it was like he'd gotten a small grant um, from USDA SARE program for about fifteen thousand dollars to just basically ramp up his DIY system at our on our small farm okay. to do some experimentation. And with that, he was able to then get the proof and the data to support that you could really have a lot of plants blooming uh -huh. in aquaponics, even in that DIY. We got dahlias. He got like 15 different varieties to bloom there, of which we had been told that'll never work. Wow. So that was, that was a proof of concept thing. And okay. he used that data then to apply for this other large grant from the state of Maryland. Um, and it, he got it. So that that was the, yeah that was the thing that changed everything because once that money was available to actually build it we were like well where the hell are we going to put this thing right because we live on one acre <laughs> <laughs> how, how are we gonna how are we gonna do this and it became pretty clear that these things collided at, at, a, at a moment when we were also thinking about expansion I was wanting to to figure out how to get out of my job he had already quit his job and was focusing on the farm full time so anyway all the 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 universe, all the planets were starting to align, and um, it, but it was the grant that helped build this this system that we currently are going to show pictures of, uh -huh. and yeah. is brand new to us. But I just wanted people to know that persistence does pay off um, yeah. on grant funding, um, and wow. that's one of our goals as a business is to help more farmers get access to this money, which it's it seems almost inaccessible. And, it, and right. it's very hard to get, and it shouldn't be as hard as it is. But anyway, that's so, hard. Right. So I believe I have the photo right here. Is this the machine you guys are talking about? Well, that's the. So those are the fish tanks, and those are the fish. Okay. And you can kind of see there's those are koi. Um, oh. And so okay. koi, koi are a very common fish to use in these systems, mm -hmm. um, primarily because they're super hardy. They can tolerate temperature ranges from 35 degrees to 95 degrees, which is a huge okay. range, right? Right. So. Okay. They're really hardy. They'll eat almost anything and they live a long time. And so they're a really good fish. Now, typical, now koi are purely ornamental, right? They're not a food fish. So right. you, you, okay. can't, you can't eat them. There are some complications when it comes to uh, the type of fish that you, you use, because if you want to sell the fish and as a food them. fish and yeah. harvest it and sell it, you have to have certain licenses and permits to do that. So now if you're just growing it for your own reasons, uh -huh. Kara, Right. <laughs> you have to have that, right? Right. A lot um, of people. A lot of people use tilapia. Yeah, tilapia is a very common oh, one because it's. A, my husband would be so excited to hear you say that because yeah. I was going to tell you guys. So my husband, for years now, like we have our own little homestead, we raise a lot of our food here, and um, he's been wanting to grow aquaponically for years now, and so he has finally dug a big hole. He bought a big pool from Walmart. I don't even know if that's what you're supposed to do, but he bought a big pool from Walmart. We haven't done anything with it yet, but he keeps saying tilapia. I want to grow tilapia. And uh, we had a question about that because we heard like if the water gets below 45 degrees or something like that. The fish wouldn't live. And um, Tom can help him with all of this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. I'm, all of it. I'm definitely, I've definitely done my thing. Um, and, and yeah, somebody just commented actually that, that you can sell koi too. You can. To, to people, like, I mean, people are buying them for their ornamental ponds all the time, you know. We have so, a, we have a, a, another aquaponic farm. They do veggies, lettuce uh, production here in our, in Maryland. And the guy that runs their day-to-day -day operations came out to visit and he, um, he said that, uh, you know, they have tilapia in one tank and koi in another. Okay. He wishes that they had gone straight koi because they've run into problems with being able to harvest the tilapia for sale. Um, but he also said that some of these, you know, Asian restaurants and things that want okay. to buy koi, they get huge, by the way. He said some of the fish that are in his tank are only a couple of years old are like, you know, two and three feet long. I mean, I they're you're massive, right? And at that point, you have to, the system can get out of out of sync too. It's like right. if the fish get too overwhelmed. So you're going to have to move them out of the system right. if, they, if they get too much. But anyway, yeah, there's a, it's another possible revenue stream. Probably not huge, but right. something else to consider, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry, you want to you wanna show some more of those pictures? I can I can talk through some of yeah. those. Yeah. Yes, um, please. Let's see. This one right here is 
Yeah, so that's a good one. So, so that is, um, so, so one of the things I didn't get to mention that is another advantage of these types of growing systems is everything can be grown at waist height. Okay. So, oh, nice. I, I, <laughs> yeah. For a flower farmer, for somebody who's growing in the dirt, uh -huh. you, we bend, we bend over like ten thousand times a day, right? Yeah. Like uh -huh. it's, it's ridiculous. Like our Kara backs, knows this. Kara knows. Yeah. Your back is killing you some days because you've all you've done is just bend over the whole time. So being able to grow things at waist height where it's literally I don't have to bend over to, to harvest. So that picture was it's a bench, right? So it's a bench okay. that's about three, three and a half feet off the ground. Uh -huh. and so everything can be grown like the flowers grow up and you literally are just reaching directly across, yeah. right? Cutting. Mm -hmm. So there in that particular picture are cosmos, marigolds. Uh -huh. um, I think there's some zinnias in there. We're, we're, Ooh, we're that was taken a while ago because they're yeah, actually they're, now all blooming. Yeah, that was taken a little while okay. ago, so we're, we're blooming okay. now. But but, um, but that that system there is 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 a prime example of first of all how much you can fit in these systems. So on that one bench, it extends down about 45 feet, and it's uh, maybe about seven 750 plants you can fit in there. So wow. you can grow quite a lot, and and that's just true of flowers in general, right? A lot of them that's right. very much more vertical, right? Like so, you yeah. have to have support, but you can grow like a lot crammed into a small space. Mm -hmm. And so that's the nice thing about it is we're going to get be able to get a lot of stems out of out of a relatively small space in this greenhouse. So it's and and so to to answer, um, I, well, it's it's a question that you know I think people probably have is about what can you actually grow in these systems. Uh -huh. um, the, the more basic stuff is like sunflowers are amazing. Sunflowers are one of the best things to grow in these systems, primarily because sunflowers are, are what are called day neutral when it comes to photo period. They right. don't care if it's a short day or a long day, they'll, they'll bloom no matter what. They may grow a little bit better in certain environments, but they generally don't care. Um, right. And they also have very minimal nutrient requirements. So they're similar, they're kind of like the lettuce of the flower world. They'll, they'll grow on a little bit of yeah. nitrogen and, and, yeah. and phosphorus and potassium. So, yeah. so they're really good. Zinnias, sunflower or uh, uh, zinnias, cosmos, um, uh, marigolds, um, uh -huh. the, the, the workhorse summer, summer uh, right. annuals love these environments because again, not huge requirements on nutrients and also just very resilient germinate really well. These are these are the ones that I think you know we're definitely going to be able to consistently grow. Okay. The thing that's interesting about this system, the way that I wrote these grants is not for the easy ones. It's for <laughs> right. the ones that are harder to grow, but are also more valuable to designers, florists, consumers. The okay. dahlias, the lisianthus, the uh -huh. you know ridiculous. Um, you know, these flowers that we as flower farmers know are the high dollar value. I mean, you can get, you know, two, three bucks a stem for dahlias and lisianthus oh, and, and right. you know, we're yeah. closer up too. So these are, these are the, the flowers that if we could grow in these systems, gaining all of these benefits environmentally, but also gaining some of the growth, you know, uh, enhancements that you can get in these systems too. And we, being able to grow them off season. Year round. Absolutely. Sure. Huge, huge benefit to the farmer, right? And especially to the flower farmer. Because if I can say, hey, I got dahlias in January. Oh, yeah. How, how much I could charge. For that. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and better quality and, you know, better, you know, all of the benefits of local, you know. Yeah. So my brain is churning wow. here, dahlias in January. So tell us about the setup. Like, is this aquaponic system in a big greenhouse? Do you have lights going yep. at all hours yep. of the so, day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a 30, this one is a 30 foot by 60 foot greenhouse, which is larger for sure. And it's, uh -huh. and it, you know, it's it definitely can, can hold quite a lot. Um, typically, you know, the greenhouses that are in operation for some of these larger, you know, farms are like acres of greenhouse. And eventually we would like to get to that place where we have that kind of scale. But for right now it's 30 by 60. It's a great little proving ground. You know, mm -hmm. we can, we can grow, I would say probably, you know, I'm hoping in the range of four to 5,000 plants in this space. Um, we uh, it's, it obviously has to be heated, which is one of the challenges of growing indoors and can be yeah. very pricey and can right. cause some of the issues. Um, and that's a whole other aspect of, of growing indoors that, that I think it needs to be addressed in the sustainable farming world is, you know, right now we have a propane heater in there right. and we really don't like having to necessarily use propane because it's obviously burning fossil fuels and it's mm -hmm. not ideal. And so we're we're going to eventually remove to move to the renewable energy space. We're going to do wind and solar and all that. Right. Um, but for right now, that's what we have. So 
it's basically three main bench top areas where we're growing in what are called float trays. And that's essentially just a giant open like little pool, right? Similar to your husband's dugout hole. It's a, <laughs> right. like a, like a so large, it's a Walmart kiddie pool. Right. Yeah. It's like a open water area that you can grow. You can put rafts in like styrofoam rafts. And this is okay. typically how they grow the vegetables, right? They put the little plant in a little hole in the raft and then they float it on the water. And then the, the, root, the system. root systems grow down into the water. Now, let me let me establish a really important point about uh-huh. growing in water. OK, because okay. so a lot of people, a lot of people go, hey, I, most plants don't like sitting in water like most plants would rot and most plants would be unhappy in water with wet feet. Right. Like there's some plants that don't mind that, but most would not like it, especially dahlias. They would rot out. Tubers would rot out in a second. Right. So here's the thing. What is more, what is important about understanding what plants want is that everybody thinks like, Oh, CO2 plants need to absorb CO2, right. And use sunlight to create sugars. And that's what they do. The, the green part of the plant wants that the part underneath the soil, the roots, they mm-hmm. want oxygen. They want oxygen. They're respiring, yeah. like they're dividing and, and they want an oxygenated environment. And that's why there's, there's a good example of why that was last week of what happens when these roots get into these. Those were, systems. those were cosmos. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. The roots are, the roots are extremely happy. And the reason they're extremely happy is because we are constantly oxygenating the water. We're okay. pumping oxygen into the float trays. We're pumping oxygen into the sumps where the where the water, the nutrient water is being fed from. We're constantly adding as much oxygen as we can. Mm-hmm. And that is also what makes the roots extremely happy. And that's true of soil as well, right? Like anybody knows that if you've got super compacted, you know, mm-hmm. non-porous soil, roots are not going to do well. Plants will not thrive. What you want is that, you know, light, fluffy, loam, airy, you know, that, that drains well, but has lots of oxygen flow. It Roots are extremely happy in those environments. So th- this is a key factor when it comes to growing in these environments is knowing that it's not just, it's not that they're in water, it's that they're in hyper oxygenated water. Okay. So anyway, that's a good, thank you for showing that picture though, because that's a demonstration <laughs> of, of what those root systems can look like and how happy these plants are. So, oh, wow. yeah. Uh, sorry, I have a little wasp <laughs> that has flown into my <laughs> studio and it's like right here. So I'm like, oh, hello. I'm like, okay. Um, I would love, so you guys love to grow dahlias. And yes. I hear that you have something fun to show us today and teach us about. We do. Yeah. So this, um, we're going to try this and, and it's going to be a little awkward, but so this, this right here is a dahlia that ironically enough just came out of the greenhouse. Okay. So wow. this is a, this is actually a tuber though, that we, was this one that your mom gave us? It's a Cornell. A I, Cornell. I think maybe we got it from my mom. Yeah. So we just, we would just pot it up a tuber and this is how, it, so let me just say a couple of introductory things. If you grow dahlias, you know that most the most traditional way to grow them is to order tubers and right. put tubers in the ground. They look like potatoes. You have they have to have a, a couple components to be able to successfully, um, you know, throw up green growth. An eye, a, a stable neck um, associated with the tuber. It's all this lingo about dahlias. Mm-hmm. You can also grow dahlias from rooted cuttings. And essentially what you're doing in both cases is you're just simply making a clone of the plant. The tuber is a clone of the mother tuber. And a cutting, which is a, a, a green growth that's coming from the tuber, if this is divided off of here and then you're trying to grow from that, it's going to be as, essentially a clone of the mother plant as well. So both mechanisms work just as well. Um, a rooted cutting is not going to have a tuber that grows more tubers, but it's going to have roots that actually grow tubers in the soil. So either way, at the end of a season, you're going to have tubers to, to divide. We've noticed that tubers from cuttings are a little bit smaller because mm-hmm. they just haven't had the kind of, you know, they don't, and they divide as well, but you may not get as robust a tuber production if uh-huh. you're growing cuttings as opposed to tubers. So to make a long story short, um, we got into this in part because we became obsessed with dahlias as most people do when they start growing them. Mm-hmm. I, I got obsessed with wanting to grow all the different varieties, which I've gotten a little smarter about now. So I don't, I'm, <laughs> wanting, to, I'm wanting to actually streamline things now because yeah. 20,000 know, 20, plus varieties. I think it would be a little, you can get, uh, go down hard. the rabbit hole a bit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> next, next year we should have 20,000 plants and it's just a lot, right? Oh, wow. So 
you've got to get really smart about what things sell well, what things actually are good cuts, because there's some values that just don't make great cut flowers. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the beauties of doing this is that um, you can increase your production of dahlias like exponential growth by, by learning how to either divide the tubers by digging them up at the end of the uh -huh. year or taking cuttings, either uh, axillary cuttings from the plant or taking cuttings from a tuber that's actually shooting up new growth. Um, once we learned how to do this and we kind of got it baked in, um, last year we lost half of our tubers when we moved. Uh -huh. um, they, we got a huge freeze on a, on a whole bunch of them and had to just toss a, like all of our uh -huh. cafe days, everything, uh -huh. everything. Uh -huh. Right. Um, and it was super heartbreaking, but I just was like, okay, all the crates that we know are viable, we're going to start dividing them up, potting them up, getting cuttings and start these cuttings, um, immediately. And, you know, we ended up with 10,000 dahlias. Wow. I mean, and, <laughs> yeah. We probably doubled our dahlia production and just like from three, the cutting like three months and three months right so what it what it does it, it has a couple of, of components one you're increasing your yield but if you're a farmer that's looking to actually make money right. you're not spending money on tubers and if anyone yeah. who is listening to this has gotten into dahlias you know that tubers are not cheap yeah um, if you're buying them retail as a matter of fact you're going to spend a lot of money on some of these varieties um and i'm cheap and, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to spend that kind of money on tubers, especially if I know how to have, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yes. Why would I not learn how to do this? Right. Yeah. So we're going to show you the quick and dirty way to do this. If okay. you have dahlias in the ground, you are going to have to, the easiest way to do this is not through the axillary cuttings. It's through trying to pot these up and take some cuttings from the growth that's already on the, on the tuber. Um, so if you have them in the ground and you're living in an area where you would get a hard freeze, you're going to need to pull those tubers up from the ground anyway. So you're going to pull them up and you're going to give them at least six weeks of storage in, in a cold, you know, 50 degree environment to give them a bit of a resting period and a cool period before require, you try to do this. They require this. like a dormant period. Yeah. You can't immediately go into cuttings. I made that mistake one year and I learned the hard way that that was just a really not a, a, an ideal way to do this. Um, so you're going to just store them for a bit and baby them a little bit. Dahlias are very high maintenance. You need to check on them, make sure they're not rotting or shriveling or all the things. We store, <laughs> we store ours in cedar shavings. Um, yeah. Cedar has an antimicrobial, antifungal property. And as long as they're good and dry and they're cleaned off and you put them in cedar shavings, you should be, yeah, you should, should be, be good. you should be good. And, 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 and it's really about temperature, right? You don't right. want them to freeze. No, so, so you've got to have them in a, a, a tempered environment. Um, so in any case, um, what, what was I saying? I was just going to start this. Okay. Yeah. So a couple of things about this. We now, some people are really good at this. We know a flower farmer that told us how to do this and he does everything in soil. Mm -hmm. we tried that one year and we lost every cutting that we, we took. Oh. Um, we, what? I, I find trying to root up dahlia cuttings in soil to be very challenging. Um, I think you get a lot of rot that way. And, and it, some people use rooting hormone. We have never done that. Um, and that might be more successful. We generally don't. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have found that actually trying a different medium to actually root up these cuttings is more successful. Okay. Um, we started off doing Oasis horticubes, which are bad news because Oasis, basically horticubes are just flower foam in small little cubes. I remember um, this yeah. from Instagram. I remember seeing this from your Instagram. Yeah. I mean, was that a couple years ago? Is yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And here's, here's the thing. It worked. It, it, worked well. it worked really well. I got all kinds of cuttings out of that. But once we planted them and realized that they, they don't biodegrade don't uh -huh. and you're, you're pulling up your tubers at the end of the year and all of that horti, you know, horti cube is still attached to the tuber. I was like, we can't do this. I mean, this is like, this is like basically putting plastic in our soil. Yeah. And, and if we don't think that florists should use floral foam, why are we putting floral foam in our soil? That doesn't make any sense. Right. We were on the hunt for another way to do this. We found agro wool, which is also a, a, semi-biodegradable probably would take more time than I'd like, but it's a, a better alternative. We did uh -huh. that um, uh, last it year. Worked. It did. It does work. It does work. And it works beautifully. I mean, they, they retain water. They, they root up really nicely. It worked fine. Um, this year and last year, uh, we, in the fall, we, or in the spring, excuse me, 
we bought these trays from the aquaponic source, which is the company that actually helped build the aquaponic system in our greenhouse. Okay. This is made with coca core. Um, so it is not, it looks like soil. It's not soil, um, but it's also 100% biodegradable. And so mm -hmm. it comes in pre um, drilled little cubes, holes oh. like a whole tray. I think this is a 216. Uh, 128. Oh, 128. Um, and so it's already like pre-drilled holes and it makes it super easy. And, you know, we have some systems to help us now with automatic watering and lighting and all that. And we'll talk about that in a minute, which a lot of people don't have that, that advantage, but we'll discuss it. Um, and it's, it's as simple as this when you have, I don't know if anyone can see this. I can. Yeah. Oh, I see the plant. Uh -huh. yeah. see. Okay. Move it to the, there we go. Okay. Okay. So here you have a tuber right here, right? Uh -huh. This is the this is the eye where the plant is growing from here. And all you're gonna do is now I could take a cutting from this one too, and I'll show you that in a minute. That would be an axillary cutting because you're not cutting from the tuber, you're cutting from the plant, right? A little yeah. harder to get these to root in. But the ones that come from directly from the tuber are actually fairly easy. And all you do is you find the base of where it is attached to the tuber neck. And I'm, this is going to be so awkward, but you're just literally going to move it around uh -huh. like back and forth and wiggle it off the tuber, right? So when you're finished, I've just pulled this off. I've just pulled off the green growth that was growing at the top of that neck. Okay. 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 Yes. So you see, can you see? Uh, yeah, I can see. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So all I do when I'm finished with pulling this off is I literally, now this one looks a little bit funky. I would probably pull this piece off because the leaves just look a little funky and she's like doing this weird growing down, but that's okay. I don't really care about that because I could cut that off later. What I care about is that this here, where these nodes are above uh -huh. where I've pulled off the, the tuber, that's where the rooting is going to start from. So all I do literally is pull that off and simply stick it in the plug tray, you know, this is so awkward. Okay. I know. So I would <laughs> A little fire? Yeah. I would just stick it in the plug tray uh -huh. like oh. that and, and we're done. <laughs> oh, wow. Like, yeah. Literally that's how simple it is. Now it takes around, we have, a, we have systems that we got that are, we can actually post this if people are interested in, in this kind of information um, these systems now, which make making seeding and, and rooting so much easier because it's all just like set it and forget it. It feels like it's Ron Popeil, like a, you know, like a, an appliance, right? You don't have to even think about it. You, you, you fill this tray, you stick it in the system and it has a tank of water from underneath and it's, and it's all integrated so that it's on a timer. And so it floods the system and then it drains it and it floods it and it drains it. And then the lighting of right is right above that, the LED lighting, and it's getting the light it needs on a timer as well. It's almost like a it's almost like a miniature hydroponic nursery. Yeah, basically. Okay. Wow. So we have shelves of those. I mean, if this is a 128 cell, I can get four trays across one level, and I've got four levels. So, so it's a in, little more than 2,000 cuttings you could have in one nursery. Right. So. And it's been a game changer for our business because what it what it's meant is is that we've been able to do um, pretty high intensity um, volume in terms of cuttings yeah. um, and not have to be fussing constantly on them. When I was doing them in my grow room at our old house, it was this tiny little room, and I was you know under lights and they were on shelves and they were you know there was fungus gnats and I had to go in and make sure I watered it just right. And it was just a pain. Yeah. Um, this system is not a pain. <laughs> Okay. It's about as easy as it could get, which really? has made our lives so much easier. Because we also seeded all of our um, hardy annuals for spring in those systems. Literally put seeds in trays, put the trays in there and walked away. And, you know, four weeks later, we have plants that can go on the ground. Oh, wow. So, yeah, wow. really, really nice. It, you know, it's one, it's one of those things that we, we encourage a lot of farmers to yeah. do, which is automate as much yeah. as you can. Because ultimately we just, we need to be more efficient. We have to do more with, with less manpower. And, okay. and so these, these systems are, I mean, just absolute game changers for us. I I'm happy to share the the link for these systems. So they, they're called grow Asis nurseries and they're about $1,500 for one system, but mm -hmm. that literally will pay for itself. If you think about like, Hey, if I sold, you know, 
a couple of well, trays of cans, you'd, you'd already make up that money. I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, so if you, it's a wise investment, it is, it really is. It's an investment in, in, in just your time too, and your efficiency. So mm -hmm. anyway, it's, that's one thing that's really sort of, you know, made this even more lucrative and helpful for us. What's, what's been a game changer for me is that of course we have access to wholesale, um, you know, sourcing. And so, you know, on occasion, like this particular year, we are bringing in some wholesale tubers because I needed to get guaranteed production on certain varieties that I really wanted to hone in on. Um, but, but I've also, what I did strategically this year is picked from our field, the varieties that I knew were true to type that I could easily identify and that were really growing robust, beautiful blooms. I mm -hmm. tagged those plants and I said, I'm going to limit next year. I'm going to get it down to about 15 varieties that are tried and true varieties that I know are going to sell well. I could sell every flower I produce because <laughs> they're, they're just, they're guaranteed income uh -huh. for us. And rather than having our dolly field currently this year was just like, we didn't have any time. So we literally just threw every tuber and every cutting in the ground because it was like, just get them in the ground. We don't have time to right. figure out what is what this, this new field, which will ho hopefully house another 10,000 dahlias is a more intentional focused, more production field in which I'm really honing in on the things that I know are going to be smart for our business. Right. Um, and so some of those I got sourced, but the others are going to be essentially cuttings that I'm taking from tubers that I'm pulling out of the ground and I'm going to start in January and by spring, mid May, early June, and, and it's time to plant all of these. I'm hoping to have had enough production of those blooms that I will have saved myself thousands of dollars in costs associated with tuber buying. So I, it has been a game changer for me. I would love to have our business go in this direction to be able to assist um, and give people access to rooted cuttings because I think that it's an easier thing to also for a lot of gardeners to plant because it's like you're planting a plug tray. It's a plug. Right. Okay. It's not, you're, you're planting roots. You don't have to worry about a, a, a tuber rotting because you've overwatered it too soon. I mean, uh -huh. tubers can just be kind of finicky to deal with, especially for an inexperienced gardener. Right. Um, and if you had yeah. something in a plug tray that just had roots and it was just like, Anna, Anna's like me, <laughs> I saw your hand go up on us. Yeah. This year we tried to get Anna to grow sunflowers and zinnias. I'm not exactly sure what happened. I don't think they grew though, but we're going to get her growing <laughs> sunflowers though. She's yeah. in Southern California and tip top. Of well, oh, you're in the perfect yeah. climate. Well, you, have no, you have no excuses, Anna. We'll get you. <laughs> A lot of happy birds in my backyard. Yeah, that could, yeah. That could be an issue. Know. That could be an issue. Yeah, nothing. Can, oh no, they started to grow. We had like these little tiny things, and then they disappeared. Everything. <laughs> Maybe yeah. someone munched on them. Yeah, you might have bunnies too. I'm gonna try. Mm -hmm. That could be an issue. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we, I, I think that we and a, a lot of flower farmers are trying to do is, and I, you know, before we hopped on this this live, I was we were discussing a little bit about how Tom and I have become sort of obsessive about business, mm -hmm. um, and what it means to actually run a profitable flower farming business. It's mm -hmm. not an easy thing to do. Um, right. We have some strategic disadvantages from import flowers, which are being sold and brought here with um, very little. Um, well, it's just, it's almost impossible to compete on those price points. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, for flower farmers here, focusing on those kinds of flowers that you can grow that are not easily shippable, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to pivot towards things that are going to sell well, that you are, you have a strategic advantage from a local bloom and dahlias are definitely one of those flowers. Absolutely. They do, they do not ship well. Um, people are trying to ship them. I don't think successfully. Um, you're never going to find a, an imported dahlia or even a dahlia that's been driven on a plane or flown on a plane. It's going to look the same as a dahlia in a bucket that's been come from a little farm. It just, yeah. it's just not possible. It's, I mean, the, 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 the revenue is telling us that too, right? Like the demand is just insane for these flowers, right? And so everything that we've learned over the last couple of years has been, you cannot grow enough dahlias mm -hmm. as a local farm because it's just one of those products that first of all you can make a lot of money on per stem but also it just it's a higher quality product and they're and always going to get they're and, always going to be better and not everybody can do it really well i mean i don't, I wouldn't say tom and i do it really well 
per se. We so still always, have so much to you're learn. Always learning um, but but, but we flowers. but we've kind of honed in, and I think you know Tom's got a particular advantage in just having that science mindset. So when things aren't working, I mean, he can he can easily. I'll be like, what is going on? Like, what is this thing that's you know? And we can, well, not not we. He <laughs> usually <laughs> he can usually figure out what might be helpful, and then. Um, and then we, we just, if, if something's failing, we just have this motto in our business of fail fast and move on. Right. Well, you know, before the show, let me, I just came up with an idea for you guys before the show, you were talking about what kind of videos you could make for Bloom TV. And I think you have a lot of stuff that is so different than what everyone else is doing. So <laughs> documenting all that you're doing would be a great topic for a series because I mean everyone's into Dahlia's and what you're doing not everyone else is doing you've been documenting you've been learning so you have a lot a lot out there yeah I would yeah. love to see you know I know how to grow zinnias and cosmos but I have no idea how to do that aquaponically I would love mm -hmm. to see the journey from what you do to start to mm -hmm. the process I think that'd be really fun for Bloom TV for you guys to do and show that. Yeah, I think I think that was I think that was one of our initial intents. Um, you know, obviously because it is something completely unique and novel. Like, yeah. You know, like you said nobody is really oh. doing this on, no, on right. a initial scale. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I appreciate you guys acknowledging that because it it that's the whole thing. Like it's it's flown under the radar for so long, and I think it's starting to have a little bit of a renaissance in terms of just realizing the benefits of it. But mm -hmm. when it comes to flowers, like I mean. I, I'm seeing, we're just seeing the results right now, but like, yeah, it's got, it, it could, it'll work. It's not a yeah. question of if it's just a question of how, like, and, and truth be told is that the pathway to having a huge aquaponics system, I mean, most people don't have an extra $200,000 sitting around exactly. to build a huge right. system. So, so the entry point yeah. is hard yeah. and, and, and we understand that. I mean, we wouldn't have had a commercial scale system right now had we not gotten that grant. Right. I mean, we had to take out a huge loan to be able to finance it. And, and I don't know that we would have been able to do that. Certainly not that and buy a new property. I exactly. Mean, you know, so, 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 you know, part of this is sort of like you, 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 Tom's like very much a believer in innovation. Mm -hmm. He's very much willing to take risks. Part of this is just, we're kind of going out on a limb here to think that this might be the beginning, hopefully of making some real headway into getting the United States government through grants and other things to be able to support margin, more large scale sustainability projects for up for floriculture, uh -huh. um, you know, and, 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 and someone's got to try it. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and so we're going to try it. And the focus, the focus has been on food with good reason. I mean, right. uh, we obviously need to improve our food systems, right? Like we, yeah. we can't, we cannot feed the population on traditional agriculture anymore. I mean, it's just, it's unsustainable. We've, we've known that for a long time. And so what they're, what they're starting to do is to grow, first of all, indoors in these systems, but they're also growing vertically, which is uh -huh. something that's extremely powerful. I, I read a statistic out there that you can grow the same amount of food in a two acre vertical indoor farm that you can grow in like 700 acres. Really? So, wow. Yeah, it's 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 truly about sort of, you know, rethinking uh -huh. just how we grow and and uh -huh. using using different methods and innovating in different ways, using AI to control all of the different, you know, things that you can control, the the light, the CO2, the the temperature, the nutrients, all of it. Uh, there's some really fascinating things happening. In and here's space. the other thing. I think all this stuff is really high tech and cool and there's still a part of me that's always going to want to have my hands in dirt. Right. And so and, and so I think that the other thing is a lot of people come to this um, profession or this this love of flowers because there is something very soul fulfilling about um, being in nature uh -huh. and, you know, being in a greenhouse, which feels much more sort of, you know, cold and and not very naturey, you know. Um, I, that's amazing. And I think there's all a place for that, but I also think there's also never going to be a time when I'm like, I don't want to feel grow anything yeah, no, right. I, because, because, and most people who don't like, I, for me, that is, there's a spiritual component of, of growing flowers and being in nature that is, would never be met by just greenhouse growing. Um, here, here's, here's the, here's the ultimate goal. Here's, here's what, what, what you can do, because there's one thing that you can, you probably will really never be able to make sense working in a greenhouse environment is perennials. 
Mm-hmm. It, the just the nature of it is, is that you once you put it in the spot, you're not moving it, right? Like it's going to be there, and it needs to be there for like ten years, right? Like and to be truly productive too. So you got your entire huge field of peonies and hydrangeas mm-hmm. and all of those beautiful perennials that you love, and then you grow your annuals in environments like this. And so you oh. get you get the best of both worlds, really. I mean, perennials ultimately. When, when we give advice to new flower farmers, we're like, and, and Kara, you just mentioned how you planted a thousand perennials, invest in perennials mm-hmm. because they are, they're it's just so much less work and so much more like just, you get more bang for your buck. Yeah. Like that's kind of our retirement plan is, right. is to start investing <laughs> yes. now so that we, you know, Go. 10 years from now when we can't walk, because we've peonies. destroyed our bodies of flower farming, we're going to yeah. be able to just, you know, have things that like keep the gifts yeah. that keep on getting. Uh, Tell us, what are some of your favorite perennials that you've planted that you grow? I would love to pick your brain about perennials too, Kara, because I've <laughs> watched you, I watched you plant all of those perennials. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I you know, I love peonies, of course. It's kind of an obvious one, but I like, you know, heptacodium I want to get on my farm. Um, I love all kinds of spirea, viburnum. Me hellebore. too. Oh, hellebore. <laughs> oh my god, I'm obsessed I love with hellebore. Oh yeah. god. Couldn't grow enough of it. Yeah. Um, Ranja, I love um, as a perennial. I we have I've got about ten thousand daffodil, fancy daffodils in this. Oh, yes. yeah. You know, I love, love another favorite. <laughs> yeah. So one that I grow that um, it's kind of been. I don't know. I don't want to say the word new to a lot of people, but like I love pinstamen. I just really love uh, pinstamen. Yes. Um, uh, Onyx and pearls and black beer. Like it has to be like I grow those two and they get huge. Like not every pinstamen is the same, but the onyx and pearls and the black beer. I mean, goodness, my stems were a good three feet tall and they I planted the plant um, a plug one year. And by the next year, it had tripled in size. And I love it because I actually have it behind me right here. Um, well, it dries really nicely too, doesn't it, Kara? Well, yeah, I was going to show you. Yeah, it dries really nicely, and I and um, I think designers would really love it. I love it because I use I've used it in wedding bouquets. I use it in boutonnieres. I use it in fall wreaths. Mm-hmm. It's a good perennial in my book. <laughs> you know what? Is another great one too. You can. I love anything that has like multiple use, right? It's right. a great flower, but you can dry it, whatever. Um, sedum. I, oh, I don't, yeah. yeah. I mean, I could grow so. 8,000, you know, autumn joy sedum plants and I'd be happy. Basically, I've got all some dried right here. Oh, there, it is. there it is. It's perfect. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, I have um, a lot of people I'm sure will want to reach out to you. So, what's the best way to ask questions? Your Instagram account or we have your Instagram there. Yeah, we we are on Facebook, except I, I rarely go on Facebook. Um, Instagram, Instagram is, is where we where Instagram we land almost every day. The um, website the website has a contact mm-hmm. um, for us as well, so you can yeah. reach out. That just emails us. Um, but and then yeah, I mean, I hopefully you know if anyone really can they can get a hold of us if they need to yeah. by, by a lot of different yeah, ways. Yeah, it's not hard. And we're happy to always respond and engage. We're we're good about that because we don't. We know it's important to to, to, well, to connect. I can't wait to see your videos for you to yeah. document everything. Really, seriously, no. you have an aquaponics thing. I mean, me as someone that grows a lot of plants, I would dive into your videos of mm-hmm. aquaponics because that's just not something we can. A lot do. of people would. No, that's all. That's all I need to hear. I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, we'll we're, we're going to get on it. We'll yeah. On it. And one other thing, can I just do a really quick plug for yeah. something? So for anyone that does grow Vitalias, I wanted to just show you guys really quick. This is something I just did this year and I wanted to show you. I just started preserving my dahlias in silica. Ooh, beautiful. That's a a cafe au lait. Wow. That That looks fantastic. Right? And these dahlias are basically just being preserved. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Right? You see that? Yep. Yep. Oh, wow. So did you yeah. dry all of them in silica? Because I drew, I dried dahlias, but I just hung them to dry. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, so the, the, wow. When you hang them, we've hung some too, and they 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 shrivel a little bit more. The with color. the silica, with the silica, they preserve a little bit more naturally. Yeah. And they don't lose their their oh, shape that's as amazing. much. Yeah, it's Those a little bit more work, and the the silica is a little yeah. bit messy, but it it is nice. It works. I really mean, well. and here's a purple one for you, Kara. Oh, I love it beautiful 
I mean, I can just see those in a hair piece. Like yeah, right now, like glue them to there. I'll have to try silica. That is so yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, it's super fun. Yay. Awesome. Okay. Well, Tom, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. We for having us. Yeah. So much fun talking with you. And I just want to remind our audience that is watching either live, and we have several people that watch on the replay. Uh, Bloom TV is offering a free month uh, to view the content on there. And Tom and Sarah have a video talking about their journey on there. Here you go. If you go to bloomtvnetwork.com and subscribe, just use the code flowers and that will get you one free month of Bloom TV. Yeah. So fun. So fun. <laughs> Let's thank our sponsors for this show. What? Yes. We have built the world's first flower-focused streaming network, bringing the public educational and entertaining shows that highlight the magic of flowers. Learn how to heal through flowers, cook with flowers, design your living space to reflect nature, make crafts using florals, sustainably garden, and so much more. We are your network for all things floral. Join us at Bloom TV as we help bring beauty to the lives of people and the planet through nature's most beautiful creation, the flower. Thank you, everyone. Be sure to join us next week, next Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And we would love to be here with you. Why, Kara? Because everything is better with flowers and friends. Thank Yay. you guys.